Bless those in attendance. Bless pastor and help us to keep distractions to a minimum. Open our hearts to your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, you're there in the book of 1 Timothy, and I'd like you to look down at verse number 13. For 1 Timothy chapter number 2 and verse number 13. And I'd like you to notice what the Bible says here in verse number 13. The Bible says, For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. You may be familiar with the story of Adam and Eve. You can find the story in the book of Genesis, chapter number 3. You remember the story that Satan, uh, in the form the devil, in the form of a serpent, appeared uh, to uh, Eve and uh, Adam. And the Bible tells us here that he deceived the woman. He tricked her. He beguiled her, it tells us in other passages, and uh, brought her to sin. And, of course, her husband followed in that track. And what I want you to notice uh, this morning, just kind of as I lay a foundation for the sermon, is this. When the devil decided to attack mankind, he chose to attack the woman. He chose to attack Eve. He chose to... He didn't go to Adam the Bible tells us he went to Eve. And I'd like you to understand something. And uh, keep your finger there in, in 1 Timothy. We're going to come right back to it. Go with me to the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter number 1, uh, if you don't mind. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. And then you've got the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. When you get to 1 Corinthians, do me a favor and put a bulletin or a ribbon or a bookmark or something there in 1 Corinthians. Because we're going to be in 1 Corinthians a lot throughout the sermon. We're going to leave it, but we're going to come back to it. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, when Satan, when the devil decided to attack mankind, he chose a woman. When he decided to attack humanity, he chose Eve. And I think there's a reason for that. In, in many ways, you know, uh, my, my, the, the little card that my children got from my wife this morning for Mother's Day said, uh, you are the glue that holds this family together. And then when, they, when it, you open it, it says, that's a nice way of saying you're stuck with us, you know. And in a lot of ways, a, a woman and a mother and a wife is the glue that holds a family together. And uh, they, uh, the devil chose to attack Eve. And I want you to understand something. I believe that the devil is attacking women today. I believe that there is a full-fledged attack on womanhood today. And I, I, I don't want to just preach to mothers this morning, but I do want to preach to just women in general. And I want to explain to you that Satan doesn't change a lot. You know, his first uh, idea was, let me attack women, and if I can attack Eve, then I will affect Adam. And if I can affect Adam, then I will affect uh, their family and all their generations. And of course, you know and I know that as a result of that, we, we're all sinners. But here's the thing. I believe that today, Satan has an agenda to attack women, to attack ladies, to attack womanhood, and, and he's still trying to trick and beguile and deceive. Now, I, I want to give you some very practical things this morning in regards to, to how Satan is attacking women, but I want you to notice before we get into that, look at 1 Corinthians in chapter number one. Now, I'd like you to notice verse number 18. The Bible says this, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Because a lot of the things that I'm going to say this morning, you may say, I've never heard that before, or I've never thought about that, or I can't believe, you know, that the Bible says that. I'm going to prove everything to you from the Bible this morning, but I want you to notice the Bible says that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, meaning unbelievers, those that are not saved. It's foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Notice verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. God says, show me a wise person, and I'll just destroy that. He said, show me a prudent person and I'll bring that to, no to nothing. Look at verse 20. He says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? And that's the key word. He's talking about wise people of this world, the wisdom of this world, the wisdom uh, 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 of our society. He says, he says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? I want you to understand something. The wisdom of this world and the way this world thinks, the, the agenda of this world, what this world pushes and, 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 and what it you know, puts up on a pedestal to God, that's foolishness. And, and in the same way, when you look at what the Bible teaches, 
Often the world will look at that and say, I can't believe the Bible says that. I can't believe God would say that, or I can't believe Christians believe that. But here's what you need to understand. Don't expect the world to understand the wisdom of God. And don't try to, you know, you know, be a Christian and try to be on the side of God and understand the, the wisdom of this world. Because the wisdom of this world to God is foolishness, and the wisdom of God to this world is foolishness. Look at verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. This world, the quote-unquote wiser it gets, the less they know God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that, they, save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks uh, seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, but unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God, I want you to notice this phrase, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You need to understand this and grasp this, that the way that God thinks and what God teaches us According to this world standards, it's foolishness. But listen, the foolishness of God is greater. It's better than the wisdom of this world. Now make your way back to 1 Timothy chapter number 2. And I'd like you to look down at verse number 13 again. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 13. Notice what the Bible says. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. I, I believe today there is an attack by the devil. There's an attack by Satan on families, on men, on women, but specifically, I believe just like he was in the days of the Garden of Eden, attacking Eve, the woman, I believe there's an attack uh, on womanhood. Now, let me say this. If I were the devil and I wanted to attack women, I wanted to destroy women and I wanted to use women to destroy men and women to destroy families and women to destroy society, you know what I would do is I would use schools, colleges, universities, I'd use the media, I'd use the culture of this world to brainwash women into thinking that having a career and having a job and owning a business or running a business or being some sort of a political leader, I would use that to try to brainwash women into thinking that having a career is more valuable than raising a child. Notice what the Bible says. You say, you know, in verse 14, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now, here's the thing. Eve messed up. Now, Adam messed up too, okay? So, I'm not, we're not bashing women. You know, they both messed up. But, you know, Eve, you know, would say she'd be guilt. You, she'd feel guilt. You know, she'd feel remorse. She'd think, oh, no, what did I do? But notice what God says in verse 15. He says, notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. Here's what he says. He says, women and Eve specifically, but all women, he says they can, they, they can make up for their mistakes or they can find value in something. You know, even though we're all sinners, he said that they can find value in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness and sobriety. Go to 1 Timothy chapter number 5. You're there in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Flip over a few pages to chapter 5. Look at verse number 14. Here's what I want you to understand. And you may think, well, you know, I can't, culture doesn't teach that. Society doesn't teach that. But here's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that the greatest value that a mother can have is that in raising her child. Today we are taught, and women are literally brainwashed in colleges and universities where they think like, oh, having a child and, you know, pursuing a career, this is valuable and this is a waste of time. You know, I need to go, you know, start a business. I need to go, and, you know, I'm all for women starting businesses. If you don't have children or, or you don't, you know, uh, have children at home, go work. I, I'm not talking to you, but I'm saying if you have a mother, and, and, I, and, you know, the virtuous woman, she ran a business from home. And I think that's great, too. But, but this idea today where we're being told, no, 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 children are a nuisance. They're a burden. Put, you know, put them somewhere, put them in some daycare somewhere, and you go do something of value with your life, and you go work somewhere. That is not what the Bible teaches. Now, that is the wisdom of this world, but that's not the wisdom of God. Amen. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. Look at verse number 14. 1 Timothy 5, 14. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, 
Guide the house. Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. The Bible teaches that God's will for any young lady's life is that she would marry, bear children, and guide the house. And let me say this. The greatest value and the greatest impact, the greatest thing that you can do for society, women, is to stay home and raise a child in the fear of the Lord, in the love of the Lord, and you say, no, 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 I want to go be the CEO of some company. That is foolishness. You get the opportunity to invest your life into an eternal soul. You get the opportunity to invest your life into a human being or two or three or four or five or however many God blesses you with. You get the opportunity to raise a child for God. And we ignore that today and say, no, 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 no. I'm going to go get a college degree. No, no, no. I'm going to go work and I'm going to let somebody else raise my children. That's the foolishness of this world. Amen. And you know, if I were the devil, I would brainwash women into thinking, no, that's acceptable. If I were the devil, I would use the media and culture to brainwash ladies into thinking, don't waste your time raising your children. That, you know, don't be a stay-at-home mom. That's, that's a waste of time. You go get a career. You go get a job. You go. But listen to me. You will regret not spending the time that you have with your children. You only have them for a short amount of time. There is an attack on mothers today. There is an attack on womanhood today. If I were the devil, I'd use schools, media, culture to brainwash women into thinking that having a career is of more value than raising a child. You know, if I were the devil and I want to destroy women, and I want to destroy men, and I want to destroy families, and I want to beguile a woman, you know what I would do? If I were the devil, I would convince women that children are a burden. And I would create a pill that would end life after conception. Because, you know, children are not something that you want to have. And I, I would call that a birth control pill. Now go to the book of Matthew real quickly. Matthew chapter number one. You say, what are you talking about? Remember that the foolishness of this world, the, the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. Matthew chapter one. Look at verse number 23. Matthew chapter one and verse 23. It should be fairly easy to find. It's the first book in the New Testament. Matthew chapter one. Look at verse number 23. Why don't you notice what the Bible says? Here's, here's one of the greatest mothers in the Bible. You've got Mary, who gave birth to the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 1, the Bible says this, Behold, a virgin shall, I want you to notice this phrase, be with child. Do you see that? Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now, I'm not going to have you turn there, or you can turn there if you'd like, but you don't need to turn there. In Isaiah chapter number 7 and verse 14, this verse, you find a comparison. This verse is actually quoted out of Isaiah, and in Isaiah it's quoted this way, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. I want you to understand that the Bible describes a woman as conceiving as a woman with child because the Bible teaches that life begins at conception. Amen. Now you say, well, why are you bringing this up? Here's why I'm bringing it up. Today, we've got birth control pills that are pushed on women, that are pushed on even 12 and 13-year-old girls in the public school system that end life after conception. You say, I, I never knew that. I never heard that. Let me read for you from an, an article. This is an, uh, a medical article that describes how hormonal contraception works. It says a woman becomes pregnant when an egg released from her ovary, that's the organ that holds her eggs, is fertilized by a man's seed. The fertilized egg attaches to the inside of a woman's womb, which is called the uterus, where it receives nourishment and develops. Hormones in the woman's body controls the release of the egg from the ovary, this is called ovulation, and prepares the body to accept a fertilized egg. Hormonal contraceptives, which include the pill, the patch, and other forms of birth control, all contain a small amount of man-made estrogen and progestin hormones. These hormones work to inhibit the body's natural cyclical hormones to prevent pregnancy. Pregnancy is prevented by a combination of factors. And I, I, wanna, I, I want you to notice how these pills work. Number one, the hormonal contraceptive usually stops the body from ovulating. All right, So it just uh, keeps the body from releasing the egg. This works 40 to 95% of the time. However, that means that there's a 5 to 60% chance that this doesn't happen. And when this doesn't happen, the egg is released and can be fertilized. But in the case that that happens, number two, the second way that 
uh, contra that the birth control pill uh, will end the pregnancy or stop someone from getting pregnant or end the pregnancy is hormonal contraceptives also will change the cervical mucus to make it difficult for the seed of a man to go through the cervix and find an egg. They'll basically, and I don't want to get into many details, details but they'll increase the mucus around the egg to keep the seed of a man from ever touching the egg and having conception or fertilization. Now up to this point, no life. No life has been created. You just stop the egg from being released. If there's never conception, then no, egg, no life is related. Up to this point, if, there's, uh, if you keep the seed from reaching the egg, then you have no life. You know, I mean, it's, it's all this medical weirdness, but whatever. You know, it's, yeah, at least you're not killing someone. Here's a third way. The last resort for hormonal contraceptive is to end the pregnancy by changing the lining of a woman so it is unlikely that a fertilized egg, an egg that has already been fertilized, conception has been made, Life has begun so that that egg will not be able to attach to the uterus, will not be able to implant, therefore not receive the needed nourishments and literally starve a child to death. And you say, why are you preaching this on Mother's Day? Look, you got your gift, okay? You got your candle, all right? Now it's time for me to preach. The kid's saying, now it's time for preaching. You say, well, I've just, my whole life, I've been, you know, the pill, you know, people told me that that's what you do to not have children. I get that, but here's the problem. From, from the days of Adam and Eve, Satan has had an agenda to trick women, beguile women. And today, women are being told, oh, just take this pill. It'll keep you from getting pregnant because children are a nuisance, because children are a burden. The Bible says, yea, children are an heritage of the Lord. The Bible says that the fruit of the womb is his reward. The Bible says that it's God who opens and closes the womb. And we ought not play God and say, well, I'm going to control when I'm going to stop having children. And, and here's the thing with birth control pills. There's a percentage of the time that they end life after conception. And today you've got Christians, you know, all, all over the radio and all over, you know, the TV. Christians are upset about abortion. And by the way, I'm upset about abortion. And they're screaming and yelling about the 3,000 children that are aborted every day and the abortion holocaust. And we ought to scream and yell about it and it's wrong and it's murder and you're ending a life after conception. But listen to me, Christian women are popping these pills and killing their own babies. Say, so, well, I didn't even know that. Well, the foolishness of, of, of the, the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. And if I were the devil, you know what I would do? I would trick women into thinking children are a burden. Here, why don't you take this pill? and kill your unborn child without even realizing it? Why don't you, you know, uh, uh, just end the life of the blessings that God is trying to get? That's what I would do if I were the devil. Let me give you another one. Go to Romans chapter number 7. Romans chapter number 7. Look at verse number 2. If I were the devil, you know what I would do? If I were the devil, I would normalize divorce in America so that 50% of children would be raised in a broken home. And look, let's just be honest. Divorce unevenly and unfairly affects women more than men. When a man leaves his wife, when they divorce, the man, basically in our society, the man just goes on on his merry way. Just works, just does whatever, no big deal, you know, uh, no problem. And you've got this woman that's left behind to raise children by themselves, and it unfairly and unevenly works against them. And you know what? God says that divorce is wrong. God says that it's a sin. You say, I've never heard that before. Well, let me show it to you. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Look at verse 2. Notice what the Bible says. For the woman which hath an husband. Romans chapter 7 verse 2. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. That's what the Bible says. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. That's why the traditional, you know, marriage ceremony says, till death do us part. Why? Because you're bound to your spouse by the law until he liveth. But if the husband be dead, you can, you can obviously change that. If the wife be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband, of his wife. Look at verse 3. So then, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. The Bible is very clear that divorce is wrong. That people should not separate. You should try to work things out as much as possible. And sometimes people will say, oh, well, you know, it's just, it, it, it can't work. It's, it's not safe, whatever. Hey, if that's the case, then great. 
Go ahead and separate, but remain unmarried, is what the Bible teaches. Until your spouse passes away, then you're free. But the Bible teaches, because here's what God wants. God wants children to be raised by a father and a mother. And God wants women to have the help of a man who's going to be there and be connected and be involved in the raising of those children. But you know what I would do if I were the devil? You know what I would do if I wanted to destroy women? You know what I would do is I would make it normal. I would make it acceptable. Accepted. I would make it just the normal thing that children, you know, uh, that divorce is just something that everybody does. 50% of people are, I mean, 50% of people in this room are divorced. And look, if you're divorced, I'm not against you. I'm not mad at you. But I'm trying to keep some young couples and some children that haven't even got married yet to realize that marriage is a very, very important thing. And when you go to that altar, don't do it flippantly. Make sure you know who you're marrying. Make sure you're making a lifelong commitment. If I were the devil, I'd normalize divorce to destroy families, to unevenly and unfairly burden mothers. That's what I would do if I was going to destroy, if I was going to attack women. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse number 18. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and verse number 18. You say, well, do we really need this type of preaching? Look, you know what's wrong with our society? Is everywhere you go, you are affirmed. Everywhere you go, people are telling you, there's nothing wrong with you. Everything is great about you. You need to change nothing. And our society is literally crumbling. I mean, today, the normal, you say, I can't believe you're preaching this. Think about what you're saying. Today, we live in a society where our, the majority of the people that we live in think it's completely normal and it's completely rational for some guy to turn himself into a woman and then walk into the woman's restroom. And, 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 and if you say, like, hey, that's a little weird, then people are like, you are a, you know, you are a hateful person. Because some dude, you know, cutting his stuff off and becoming a woman, you know, we say that's weird and perverted and it's wrong. And people are like, I can't believe you would say that. That's the wisdom of this world. And what we need is a church that will stand up and preach the Bible and say, no, here's what the Bible says. Here's what the Word of God says. And women, you know, here's the funny thing. The people that get most offended, obviously, at these type of sermons, but just in general that I've noticed is women. And they're the ones that are under, under the most attack. They're the ones that Satan, it seems like Satan just hates the most. These women are like, I can't believe you tell us to work. I'm thinking to myself, really? So your husband gets to go to work, and he gets to go hang out afterwards and do whatever he wants, and you want to go work and take care of the children? I mean, God, that is not the system that God provided. God wants women to be blessed. God wants women to be taken care of. God wants women to have a man beside them that loves God and will protect them and will take care of them. But if I were the devil, I'd try to ruin that. I'd normalize divorce in America. You know what I would do if I were the devil? Can you make your way to 1 Corinthians chapter 6? If I were the devil, I would convince young ladies that having a physical relationship before marriage is not only accepted, but expected. And that in the world that we live in today, it's totally normal to just go to bed before you're married. You know why I would do that? So that up to 40% of children, and this, this is statistically proven. Do you know that 40% of children today are born out of wedlock? Are born with no dad? in the home to a single mother who's unfairly, and, and, and again, the vast majority of these situations, who gets burdened with the children raising them by themselves? The mom does. There's an attack on women today. There's an attack to, to make it difficult for women, to make it hard for women, and the devil is convincing young ladies and telling them purity doesn't matter, being a virgin doesn't matter, being chaste doesn't matter, you be loose, you just, you know, do whatever, you go wherever. And, but here's the thing, ladies, let me tell you something. You end up pregnant, you're going to be the one that's going to burden that. And half of these guys, you know, just because they can have a child doesn't make them a man. And they don't raise their children. They don't stick there. And notice what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse 18. Flee fornication. Do you know what the Bible teaches? That it is a sin for people to go to bed before marriage? You know there was a time when every preacher in America would preach these type of sermons and say, hey, you ought to walk down the aisle virgin. You ought to walk down the aisle pure. And by the way, it's not just ladies. It's young men too. 
Our people, our young people today and our children today need to be taught to be clean and to be pure and to be separated and to walk down and to save themselves for the one that they're going to give themselves for the rest of their life. Now that's not heard of today. That's not preached today. You don't find that sermon being taught almost anywhere today. But God says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication smiteth against his own body. And by the way, let me say this while we're on it. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse 9. God thinks so badly about fornication that he even says to not allow it in church. People who are fornicating in church ought to be removed from church. That's what God says. I've never heard that. Well, let me show it to you from the Bible. I'm, people say, I've never heard half the things you've already, I, I don't know if you noticed, but I proved it all from the Bible. See, the problem is this. Most people go to churches where the pastor just gets up and says, you're doing great. You're doing wonderful. Put money in the offering plate and just go on your merry way. Go ahead and destroy your life as long as I can drive a Mercedes. Go ahead and destroy your marriage as long as I can drive a Lexus. Go ahead and destroy your marriage as long as I can be on TV and be Mr. Popular and be Mr. Whatever. But you know what? The Bible says that my job is to preach the word. My job is to, to preach and be instant in season, out of season, whether people like it, whether they don't, whether society likes it, whether they don't. We're supposed to just preach what the Bible says. All right, there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse 9. Notice what the Bible says. I wrote unto you an epistle, not to company with fornicators. God says don't company with them, don't hang out with them, don't, you know, be around them. Yet not all together with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. He said, I'm not talking about worldly people. Worldly people are going to fornicate. We get that. If you, if you separated from fornicators, you know, just in general, you'd have to quit your job, is what he's saying. Look, look verse 11. But now I've written unto you not to keep company if a man that is called a brother be a fornicator. He's talking about a Christian. If they be called a brother, be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, which such in one not to eat. He said, don't have fellowship with them. Don't go out to eat with them. Don't have them in church. He says, remove them from the congregation. Why? Because God thought it was extremely important that we raise our children in, a, in an environment where, look, my children, I've got an eight-year-old, and a six-year-old, and a four-year-old, and a one-year-old, and one on the way, or almost two-year-old, and one on the way. And look, my children need to be raised in a church where they see that the normal thing is for a man to keep himself clean and pure and for a young lady to keep herself clean and pure and to walk down an aisle and be virgin and, and make a commitment to themselves and stay married for the rest of their lives and a man is married to a woman they, they don't need to see two people shacking up and we just acting like it's normal and you say, well, at every other church, I don't really care what every other church does. I care what the Bible says. And the Bible says, hey, if you're in fornication, you know what? If you're in fornication, you, need to, you either need to get right or you need to get out. Amen. We don't need you here. You say, well, don't you need our tithe? No, we don't. We've never, we've never worried about offerings. We've never worried about attendance. You know what? God's taking care of both. And we never started this church to try to have some sort of a mega church and I'm going to be all over the TV. We started this church to preach the word of God and we'll find a few people who actually care what the Bible says. Who actually want to learn what the word of God says. And listen, if you're fornicating, you're sleeping with someone you're not married to, or you're, you know, shacking up, get out or get right. And, and you, say, you, you say, well, you just want people to leave. No, I don't want you to leave. I'd rather you just get right with God. But I realize this, some people are too selfish to get right with God. And if you don't care about that, then just don't be here. Go to go, the church down the street. They'll, they'll love you fornicating. They'll high-five you fornicating. They'll say there's nothing wrong with you fornicating. But that's not what the Bible says. If I were the devil, I'd normalize divorce in America to, to destroy women. If I were the devil, I would convince young ladies that they're... I, I would use MTV. I would use music. I would use music videos. I would use artists. I would use billboards to teach young ladies that their body is wor worth nothing. It's just a piece of me. I would, I would make the most popular people in our country just these loose women that show off their bodies, these whores is what the Bible calls them, I, will, I would make them the most popular so young girls rise up, so they grow up and think that's the only value that I have is my body. And if I don't let a young boy just have his way with me, then he's not going to want to hang out with me. That's what I would do. I would brainwash women into thinking the only value they have is their body, so just let guys do whatever they want, and then I would destroy a nation as a result of it. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, look at, verse, look at verse 14. You know what I would do if I were the devil? 
If I want to attack women, if I want to destroy society, you know how you destroy a society? You attack women. You know how you destroy a family? You attack mom. If I were the devil, I would have women cut their hair short and put a pair of pants on them like a man. And I'd teach men to be effeminate little queers. And I'd teach men to just act like a bunch of little girls and put on little tight pants on, and little tight shirts on. And I'd try to blur the line between the sexes. That's what I would do if I were the devil. Notice what 1 Corinthians chapter 11, look at verse 14 says. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? I, I didn't know the Bible said. You know the Bible says that God wants men to have short hair? That's what the Bible says. Notice verse 15. But if a woman have long hair, it is glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. You know that God says, I want men to have short hair. I want women to have long hair. You say, I never knew the Bible. You know the Bible talks about everything? Yeah, the Bible talks about how God wants you to dress, the way God wants you to look, the things He wants you to say. The Bible covers everything in life. And God says, I want men to have short hair. I want women to have long hair. And here's why He said it. Because He says, I want there to be a difference between male and female. He said, I want you to be able to look at a man and say, that's a man. And I want you to be able to look at a woman and say, that's a woman. And in here in 1 Corinthians 11, He tells us, hey, it's a shame. It's a shame for a man to have long hair. Uh, and then today we're taught oh, Jesus had long hair. Let me tell you something. Jesus did not have long hair. Because that would be going against the word of God when it says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. But if a woman have long hair, it is, her, it is glory to her. And let me say this, for her hair is given to her for a covering. That's what, we, don't, we don't believe in head coverings at Verity Baptist Church. You know, people, people, sometimes I get these emails, people say, yeah, the only thing that's wrong with your church is you don't tell your women to have head covering. Here's the head covering is her hair is given her for her head covering. We do believe in women having a head covering because here's what we believe. Women ought to have long hair like a woman. And men ought to have short hair like a man. That's what the Bible says. Keep your finger there in 1 Corinthians 11. Go to Deuteronomy 22. Keep your finger in 1 Corinthians 11. We're going to come right back to it. Go to Deuteronomy 22. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. If I were the devil, if I were the devil, I would try to blur the lines between the sexes. If I were the devil, I would try to make men look like women and women look like men. That's what I would do if I were the devil. That's how I attack society if I were the devil. Deuteronomy 22, look at verse 5. Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. Deuteronomy 22, 5. The Bible says this, The woman shall not wear that. Deut Deuteronomy 22, 5. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Now here's what this verse says. There is something that pertains to a man, clothing that pertains to a man, that a woman should not wear. I mean, could we agree on that? Is that clear? I'm not telling you what it is. I'm just telling you it exists. There's something out there that a woman should not wear that pertains unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. This is teaching us that there's a garment for women that men should not wear. I'm not telling you what it is. I'm just telling you. Can we all intellectually agree that that's what the Bible says? For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Now look, here's what you need to decide. God says that there is an article of clothing that belongs to a man that a woman should not wear, and there's an article of clothing that belongs to a woman that a man should not wear. You've got to decide what that is. But as you study the Bible, you know what I find that only men wear in the Bible is pants. And you know what you won't find? One reference in the Bible to what women wearing? Pants. And you know what? Historic Christianity for centuries and centuries and centuries has always believed that women have long hair and wear skirts and dresses and men have short hair and put on a pair of pants. I mean, look at the stinking sign on the bathroom door. How do you, how do you, know, you, know, how do you know which one's for male or which one's for me, female? One's wearing a skirt and one's not. Now, here's the thing. Here's the problem with our society. Our society changes. See, there was a day when you would have preached this and it would have just been normal. I mean, nobody. And here's the thing. Did you know that there was a day in America when women were arrested for wearing pants in public? Literally thrown in prison. And look, if you're sitting here and you say, I got a pair of pants, I'm not mad at you. You've been raised in this society, in this world that doesn't, that, that God, you ought to be upset at the devil for attacking you and beguiling you. You ought to be glad that someone's standing up and saying, wow, I never heard that before. Praise the Lord. We're getting the word out. But listen to me. Today, you know, today you, you preach against women wearing pants and people get upset and mad and angry. I'm never coming back here. And let me tell you something. Today, today, if Pastor Jimenez walked up here to preach, 
wearing Miss Joanne's nicest, you know, Sunday dress, you would think that's weird. But that's the problem with man's society is men change. Because I'm telling you right now, there's coming a day, there's coming a day in America when it'll be totally acceptable for men to just walk around in skirts and dresses. It's already happening. And there's coming a day when some fundamental Baptist preacher will stand up and say, you know, men really should not be wearing dresses. And people go, wow, I can't believe you'd say that. That's crazy. That's insane. But that's the problem with the wisdom of this world is changes. But you know what? God never changes. And, you know, today we're all up in arms and we're so mad. We're mad at this people and mad at that people. We're mad at Target. We're mad because we're mad this Bruce Jenner guy got changed into some woman. And we're mad because we don't want to go in a restroom. But listen to me. It started way back. It started way back. Decades and decades and decades ago, this agenda started when Satan decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try to convince women to take their skirts off and put pants on. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try to get guys to think it's cool to have long hair. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start blurring the lines between the sexes. So now you can have these sodomites just out and proud, and it's totally normal, totally accepted. Because, you know, I mean, is there really a difference? Now, look, I don't know about you, but if I were the devil, that's what I would do. If I wanted to attack women, if I wanted to attack society, and don't get, you know, don't get all mad, you're all upset about transgender while you're putting on a pair of pants, ladies. You're part of it. We're part of it. Our culture and our society is part of the issue. You're there in Deuteronomy 22? Go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. You know what I would do if I were the devil? You know what I would do if I wanted to destroy women? You know what I would do if I wanted to destroy motherhood? You know what I would do if I wanted to attack family? If I were the devil, I would create an institution where parents would volunteer to send their children away for seven hours a day, five days a week, you know, for the purpose of education. So that, that way I could just have access to their children and brainwash their children into believing stupid things like they came from a monkey or that they are to be acceptable, you know, accepting of sodomy and homosexuality. You know what I would call it? I call it the public school system. That's what I would call it. I'm just saying, if I were the devil, I would find a way to try to get parents to give me their children while they weren't around for a certain amount of time every day, for a certain amount of time every week, for a certain amount of time every year, so that I could have access to these children and teach them whatever I want without their children being present. I mean, if I were the devil, that's what I would do. I'd call it the public school. Are you there in Deuteronomy chapter 6? Look at verse 5. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. The Bible says, And thou shalt love thy, the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Notice what he says, verse 7. And thou, he says, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. You know that God gave you, mom, God gave you, dad, the responsibility of educating your children? And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Notice, he says, when you lie down, when you go to bed, I want you teaching your children. When you wake up, I want you teaching your children. When you're sitting at home, I want you teaching your children. When you're going on the road, I want you teaching the children. Where is there room here to send them off to some government institution to have them be brainwashed? Amen. Where do you find that in the Bible? Show me the public school system in the Bible where we're supposed to take our children, give them to the wicked Filthy government we live in and let them brainwash them for seven hours a day. So I can't believe you would say that. But here's the thing. The wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. And the foolishness of God is stronger than the wisdom of this world. I'm just saying, I, you know, I don't know. I'm not the devil. But if I were the devil, I think that's probably what I would do. Figure out a way to brainwash the next generation. To separate them from their children, from their parents, and then teach them things that their parents don't believe. To separate them from their parents and teach them that their loyalty ought to be to government, not mom and dad. That their loyalty ought to be to, you know, the government, not to church or the things of God. To teach them that there is no God. That's what, I mean, I'm just saying, if I were the devil and I wanted to attack Eve, that's probably what I would do. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, if I were the devil, if I were the devil, you know what I'd do? If I were the devil, you know what I'd do? I, I would make it normal for wives. In fact, I would make it a joke. 
In fact, I would make it a joke on TV, and I'd make it a joke in our society, and I'd make it a, a, a thing that people just kind of chuckled about and laughed about. If I were the devil, I would make it normal in our society for wives to not enjoy a physical relationship with their husbands and, and, and to encourage the wives to constantly and regularly deny their husbands physically. That's what I would do if I were the devil. Now, look, if you were the devil, maybe you'd do something different. But if I were do, I would, if I were the devil, I would teach women that, look, you're husband is a pervert and he's lustful and he just you know he's got issues and you just deny him regularly and and, and you don't enjoy a physical relationship with him are right, there in first Corinthians chapter 7 verse 3 let the husband render unto the wife do benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband the wife hath not power over her own body but the husband and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body but the wife look at verse 5 defraud ye not one another Look, ladies, when you deny your husband or even husbands, if you deny your wife physically, the Bible says you're defrauding, you're stealing from them. You're keeping something that belongs to them. Defraud ye not one another except to be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. He says if you're going to fast and pray, go ahead and consent for that time to not come together physically. But look, unless you're Jesus and you're fasting for 40 days or something, you know, most people are fasting for like a day, two days, three days. Look what he says, and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. He says, look, your job is to come together. Your job is to not defraud your spouse. Your job is to, to have a physical relationship on a regular basis with your spouse. You say, I can't, why are you preaching this? Because it's a big deal in marriages in America today. That's why I'm preaching it. Because our stupid society has brainwashed women into thinking, oh no, that's, that's not, you know, just your husband, he's, he's a pervert. The fact that he wants to be with you so much. Look, you know what? Quit defrauding him. Because you know what I would do if I were the devil? I would, I would brainwash women into thinking, that's, that's what you got to do. Just, you know, deny your husband. That'll help your marriage. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And look, do you know that God made your body to want to enjoy a physical relationship with your spouse? God did that. The Bible says that the marriage bed is undefiled. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. You know what I would do if I were the devil? 2 Corinthians chapter 6. If I were the devil, I would encourage Christian ladies to marry unbelievers. I would try to get Christian young ladies to marry a guy who's not saved. I would get the media to make, on TV, to make Christian men look like a bunch of wimpy, stupid idiots. I, I would make the media... To make, you know, when I was a kid growing up, there was a show, uh, there was a cartoon show, and on, on, on that show, there was a the Christian character, his name was Ned Flanders, and he was just the biggest, dumbest loser. He was just the wimpiest idiot. If I were the devil, I would make the media, make Christian men look like idiots. You know, men that get up and go to work every day, men that are loyal to their wives, Men that provide for their wives, men that protect their wife. I would make that guy look like an idiot. Then I'd take some drunken, you know, drug addicted, hasn't hold, held down a job for years, bum with long hair and a tattoo, look like the coolest guy around, so that Christian young ladies would want to marry this idiot and not a man of God. Here's why I would do that. So that when they do have a family, maybe they're, they're not the one that had a divorce. They're not the one that had a, a guy, you know, just impregnate them and leave them. They've got a guy at home, but he's not much of a spiritual leader. He's there, but he doesn't really care about the things of God. He's there, but he doesn't really know anything about God. He's there, but he's not really taking the spiritual lead. I, I'm just saying, if I were the devil, that's what I would do. Are you there in 2 Corinthians chapter 6? Look at verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? You say, well, Pastor, I don't, you, why are you, you know, look, Father's Day is coming, okay? Just hold tight. <laughs> but listen, you guys, you need to step up. You need to be the leader. You need to lead spiritually, physically, emotionally, financially. It's your job to be the head of that home. If I were the devil, I'd try to get Christian young ladies to ruin their lives by marrying some guy that's not going to lead spiritually. You know what I would do if I were the devil? Can you go to Ephesians? You're there in 2 Corinthians? Past Galatians into Ephesians? If I were the devil. No, I don't know. I'm not the devil. Some of you don't believe that, but that's okay. 
If I were the devil, you know what I would do is I would create an electronic box. And I'd call it the television, excuse me, the television. And I would put shows on that box like soap operas and daytime talk shows and reality TV. In fact, I'd create another electronic box and I'd call that thing a computer. And I'd make it small enough for you to hold in your hand. And I'd put social media sites on there like Facebook and Twitter. And you know, you say, well, why would you do that? Here's why I would do that. I would do that to assure that mothers have every opportunity to ignore their children possible. I would do that so that even the moms that are homeschooling would be spending more time on Facebook and watching television than they are raising the children they've got at home. That's what I would do. Now, I don't know what the devil would do, but if I were the devil, or in Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse 16. The Bible says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming the time speaks of value. Do you understand that there's value in time? Say, why are you preaching the sermon on Mother's Day? I mean, the little kids got up and preached. You know why I'm preaching the sermon? For those kids. Because those kids need to grow up in a church where there's a mom and a dad that realize that, Mom, Mom, you're under attack. Satan wants to destroy your family through you, Mom. Satan wants to destroy your family through you, Eve. You've only got a short amount of time with them. You've only got them for 18 years, 20 years. You know, my daughter's 35 years. <laughs> and that's when they're allowed to start dating. <laughs> I, you only have them for a short amount of time. Redeem that time. Don't waste it. If I were the devil, you know what I would do. Can you go to 1 Peter chapter 3? You there in Ephesians, you're going to go past Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter number 3. You know what I would do if I were the devil? If I were the devil and I wanted to attack women, I, want, I wanted to attack men through women, I wanted to attack homes through women, if I wanted to destroy society through women, if I were the devil, you know what I would do? Is I would teach women and I would brainwash women into thinking that submitting to their husbands is degrading and teach them to be rude and disrespectful to their husbands. I'm just saying, if I were the devil, that's what I would do. Are you there in 1 Peter chapter 3? Notice what the Bible says. Likewise, you wives. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. There's nothing degrading about putting yourself under somebody's authority. We, we do that all the time. And here's what's funny about women. They're like, I'm never going to put myself under the authority of my husband. And I'm going to go work. So you can go put yourself under the authority of some other guy. So you can go put yourself... Look, we all put ourselves under the authority of someone at some point. If the, if the cop pulls you over, most of us stop and we put ourselves under his authority. Some of you don't, and I get that. <laughs> but, you know, you know, whether you have a job, whatever, and in, in a home, God has made the man, the leader, he's put him as the head of the home. And women, it's your job to bring yourself under his authority, to be subject unto your own own husbands. You want to be subject to somebody else's husband, you know, at work. Notice what he says. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, that, by, that they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Look at verse 2. While they behold your chaste. The word chaste means pure conversation. That means lifestyle coupled with fear. Here's what he says. You, you say, well, my husband, he's not spiritual. My husband, he's not even saved. Look, he says, you just submit yourself anyways. And look, here's the thing about submitting to your husband. Let me go ahead and explain to you. We submit, the Bible says, wives are to submit unto their husbands, you know, as unto the Lord and to the Lord. The Bible says that we have to obey God rather than men. Wives, your job is to submit to your husband until he asks you to do something that goes against what God says. If your husband says, you know, I'd like to have, you know, a steak for dinner, don't say, well, too bad, you're getting macaroni and cheese again. <laughs> okay, look, just be subject unto your husband. If your husband says, hey, can you lie to my boss? and tell him I'm sick when I'm not, then look, say no, because God told me not to lie. You understand what I'm saying? If your husband says, you're not allowed to go to that church anymore, then say no, I will go to church because God commanded me to go to church. I ought to obey God rather than men. But when his direction is not conflicting, what God asked me to do, we, you are to submit. That's what the Bible says. Notice what he says, verse 2. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Look at verse 5. 
For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God. This is the Christian heritage of women. The, the holy women also who trusted in God. Notice, adorn themselves being in subjection. You know what? The, the best thing you can do to make yourself beautiful to your husband is just to have a submissive, respectful spirit. They adorn themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. Look at verse 6. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. When Abraham would say, Sarah, could you take care of this for me? She'd say, yes, Lord. Sarah, you think we should do that? Look, I'm not telling you to do that. That's not our culture. But all I'm saying is this. Sarah was a mighty woman of God. I mean, when, I, when we get to heaven, I'd like to meet Sarah. I'd like to shake her hand and say, Sarah, wow, what, what an honor, Sarah. God, God use you. You know, as we study the patriarchs over the next several weeks on Sunday night, we're going to look at the life of Sarah as well. She was a wonderful, wonderful Christian lady. But you know what? That she understood that her job was to submit herself to her husband. Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. You don't have to turn here, but Proverbs 21, 9 says this. It is better to dwell in a corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a white house. Look, you know that no guy wants to come home to some angry Rosie O'Donnell? I mean, do you understand that? <laughs> Just no guy wants to come home to some angry, upset, you know, always mad. Nobody wants to come home to that. Your husband wants to be adorned, being in subjection. Calling him Lord, hey, that'd be, that'd be a good way to get your whatever you want, ladies. Start calling your husband Lord and see how, uh, see how many times he denies your shopping spree. <laughs> I'm just saying, if I were the devil, I, I would teach women that submitting to their husbands is degrading and teach them to be rude and disrespectful to their husbands. That's what I would do. If I were the devil, that's what I would do. You know what I would do if I were the devil? If I were the devil, I would create a culture where women are encouraged to be loud and obnoxious, crude and rude, to destroy, to destroy all sense of femininity. Look down at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 4 again. Look at verse 4. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament. Notice what he says. Here's how he describes a woman. Of a meek and quiet spirit. That's how a Christian woman ought to be described. That, it, 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 you're, if someone were to say, you know, describe my wife, describe my mother, describe, you know, this Christian lady. Your goal ought to be that they would describe you in this way. That woman has a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. But you know what I would do? I teach, I teach women to cuss like men. And by the way, men ought not cuss either. But I teach, I teach young ladies that, you know, you just cuss like a guy. You just use all manner of profanity. You just be rude, and you be crude, and you be loud, and you be obnoxious. That's what I would do if I wanted to attack women. If I were the devil. Look down at verse number 3 again. I'd like you to notice something else in this passage. 1 Peter chapter 3, look at verse 3. Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair, and of wearing of gold, and of putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great, of great price. Here's what he says. He says, a woman ought to not focus as much on the outward. And look, I'm not saying women ought not focus on the outward. I think it's fine for a woman. I think, in fact, I think it's right for a woman. If you study Proverbs 31, you will find that the virtuous woman took time to take herself, to take care of herself physically. And I think you ought to try to look nice for your husband. Ladies, don't let your husband come home at 5 or 5.30 and you're in your pajamas. You're, you still got gum in your hair. You know, I, I think it's, it's, it's nice for you to take time to make yourself look nice. And to, but that not be your focus. That's not your only value. That, not, uh, that ought not be what your life is all about. My life is completely about how I look in the exterior. He says, look, who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating of the hair and of wearing of gold and of putting on a belt, but let it be the hidden man of the heart. Work on that spiritual man. Work on that hidden part uh, of your spirit. You know what I would do if I were the devil? If I were the devil, I would create, in fact, if I were the devil, 
Everything that I've said so far, I'd do that to destroy society. But you know what I would do with churches like Verity Baptist Church who don't care about society, who don't care about big numbers, who only care about preaching the Bible in truth and speaking the word of God? You know what I would do to try to destroy a church like Verity Baptist Church? Here's what I would do is I would get women to marry husbands who were on fire for God, who were spiritual, who were faithful to all the services, who were faithful to soul winners. And here's what I would do. I would find women to marry men that loved God. And they're not necessarily opposed to God, but they're just not that spiritual themselves. Do you understand what I just said? I would find women to marry men who are not going to stop their husbands from going to church. And they're going to go to church with their husbands. And they're not going to oppose Christianity. And they're not going to try to fight them on it. But they're just not that interested themselves. I would find women that would sit in the mother baby rooms during the service and instead of listening intently while the pastor's preaching, they're just on their phone playing games or checking Facebook. Amen. You know what I would do if I were the devil? I would find wives who they're not necessarily opposed to their husbands. They just don't read their Bible themselves. They just don't pray themselves. They're just not interested in soul winning themselves. If I were the devil, I would try to find a wife that would hinder the spiritual growth of her family just by her not really being that interested in the things of God. That's what I would do if I were the devil. You know, if I were the devil, I would hate. If I were the devil, I would hate a, light, a lady who found it a privilege and not a burden to have children. If I were the devil, I, I would hate the mother who saw her greatest calling as being that of raising children and not giving them up to go further a career. You know, if I were the devil, I, I would hate the lady who was committed to her marriage till death do us part. And even when things got hard and got tough, she was just dedicated to being faithful and sticking that thing out. I would hate that lady. If I were the devil, I would hate the young lady who refused to give in to her uh, physical relationship before marriage. I would hate the young lady who said, no, 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 there's value to this body. There's value to who I am. And if you want to touch me, put a ring on my finger, get me a house, go get a job, and we'll talk. I would hate that young lady. If I were the devil... I would hate the lady who decided that she was going to dress to honor God and be feminine and be covered and be modest. If I were the devil, I, I would hate the mother who decided I'm not going to outsource the educating of my children and the raising of my children to the government and I will do it myself. If I were the devil, I, I would hate the wife who made it a priority to enjoy a physical relationship with her husband. If I were the devil, I would hate the young lady who decided that she's only going to date and marry and be interested in a Christian young man who loves God as much as she does. If I were the devil, I would hate, I would hate the lady who gave her time to her family and to the things of God and refused to be distracted. If I were the devil, I would hate the lady who respected her husband, whether he deserved it or not, and who was submissive and respectful and reverent. If I were the devil, I would hate a lady who exemplifies a meek and quiet spirit. If I were the devil, the woman I would hate is a lady who's not just in church because her husband is, and if her husband didn't come, she wouldn't come, who's not just, you know, going along because her husband's on this thing. I would hate the lady who loves God and walks with God and fears God, and she's going to be faithful to God whether her husband is or not. That's who I would hate if I were the devil. question I have for you ladies is this. Which one are you? I mean, is Satan just looking down at you and saying, Eve, good job. You've fallen for all of it. Hook, line, and sinker. Beguiled. Or is the devil looking at you and saying, Man, I really wish I could trick her into X, Y, or Z. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, Lord, I know these sermons are not popular.